All right, my name is Steve Cook. I'm a senior area research specialist in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Michigan. I'm working primarily on project three in the TCORS grant. We're doing tobacco related research. Um, right now I'm doing research on pr factors predicting smoking cessation as a line of our research. We're also doing quite a lot of research on the cardiovascular and respiratory health outcomes associated with tobacco product use, including ENDS products. And this is pertinent because we're doing discrete time survival analyses quite a lot. So what I'm gonna do in the next uh, half an hour to 45 minutes is I'm gonna provide a conceptual introduction to discrete time survival models, kind of what they're used for, um, what types of research questions they're well-equipped to help answer, um, some of the underlying logic of these models and a couple, a bit of a context to when these models might not be as appropriate. And then the last half of the class, I'm going to provide a practical example using path data to show you how these analyses work, how to reshape the data, how to estimate the models and interpret the models. I'm going to run a few sensitivity analyses. We're going to end by talking about some of the things we're doing on project three to try to maximize our confidence in the results using different weights and different methodological uh, or different link functions just to show what the results look like. And I think in the absence of one perfect method, sensitivity analyses are super important. So I'll talk about some of those things we're doing in our projects and hopefully this will be really useful. Um, we've had a little bit of a technical glitch. We're using Stata for the practical example. Stata does not work on this main computer. So I'm gonna present some slides um, there's a little bit of detail on the slides, which I apologize for, probably too much text, but I'll walk you through the slides. And then after that's done, I will turn off this computer. I'll use my laptop to link to Zoom that way, and then we'll go through the practical example. Does that make sense? I, I think most people here are at least a little bit familiar with Stata. There'll be some people who aren't. I don't think it matters. I think you can take the logic from the presentation today and apply it to your preferred statistical software. I have a couple of suggested links or resources that I'll talk about a little bit at the start of the presentation. And one of those has really good resources for SAS code. And if you're an R user, I think you can also apply the same logic. Really the subtext of this discussion today is going to be that these models are logistic regression in a slightly more fancy way. So once you reshape the data set to look like a unstructured or unbalanced person period data set, the analysis is actually quite similar to logistic regression and any software can estimate those models. Um, with PATH, and that's the example I'm gonna use, we do have replicate weights, which complicates things slightly. So I'm gonna use the replicate weights, but if you're using different software, replicate weights may be less important. And that's gonna be the basic structure of the talk. So any questions, comments, feel free to interrupt, ask questions. This is meant to be a non-technical introduction. There's not gonna be a whole bunch of equations. There's not gonna be a whole lot of reference to kind of like the underlying um, statistical processes. I'm gonna talk more conceptually about why these methods matter and why we might use them. So the way to start, um, I'll just go back to the title slide. I was asked to present on standard longitudinal data analysis. It's a bit of a hard thing to conceptualize because there are many different ways to analyze data longitudinally. The discrete time survival approach, which we're gonna talk about today in some detail, is just one method to answer questions with longitudinal data. If your outcome is related to event occurrence, if you're trying to predict an event over time, an event history analysis, like smoking cessation, how long does it take for people to quit smoking? These are good methods. If you're interested in something else, and I'll talk about it in a little bit more detail, like trying to model change over time, these models aren't really well equipped to do that. So it's a little bit hard in the context of a two hour discussion to introduce you to longitudinal data analysis when I'm really only gonna talk about one specific technique. And I don't think that this technique is perfect. I think it's useful for some of our research questions. Ideally, we'd have excellent continuous time data and we'd be using continuous time survival models. I think that would be a much preferred option. But the way that a lot of longitudinal data works, including the path study, is that it's done in discrete time intervals. There's different waves. Every year, there's a wave of data. Now it's every two years. So that presents us with some logistic challenges and how we analyze the data. Because of that, discrete time models are a good choice. But there are different statistical pat or, uh, options for different types of questions. And it depends very much on your research question. 
So just to start with a little bit of a preamble about longitudinal data analysis and tobacco research. Um, as many of you know, we're all tobacco researchers. I'm new to tobacco research, by the way, which will become obvious when I have the working example. But questions about change and event occurrence are central to much tobacco research. And many questions can be answered with longitudinal data. We're lucky with PATH because we're starting to get a number of longitudinal waves of data set, which allows us to answer some longitudinal research questions. Um, tobacco research often fails to capitalize on the richness of this longitudinal data. And I'm gonna outline a couple of ways that some of the um, previous studies may be limited, may be aided by adding a longitudinal approach. Uh, the first one is using cross-sectional data to answer longitudinal research questions. There are some questions that require longitudinal data. One example is looking at you know, the cardiovascular and respiratory health effects of end products. If you do a cross-sectional study and you ask respondents whether they've ever had a diagnosis of COPD, for example, and then if they're currently using end cigarettes, you can get an association between those two variables. It's really hard to look at the time ordering of the end's exposure predicting the COPD outcome. Right? And this makes sense because a lot of people after they become sick, start using end products. So when you look at that association, it's problematic because you can't look at the time order of two variables. And there have been some studies that find the association. Um, and we'll talk about maybe some of our research at some point in the presentation. What, what we're trying to do is answer the question with longitudinal data. Uh, not tracking individuals over time is another um, potential problem. Some, some cross-sectional data sets are amazing. So a lot of questions should be answered with cross-sectional data. But when we have a longitudinal data set, I feel like you should maximize the fact that you have change over time of the variables. And with PATH, I would recommend people to use and try to use the richness, richest of the longitudinal data instead of looking at one specific wave, especially because not all those waves are um, nationally representative. So these methods, can help us to do that. Um, some studies only look at change between two time periods. Again, sometimes this is ne necessary, sometimes it's important, and sometimes it's really useful to only look at a, a, an exposure at one wave predicting an outcome at the next wave. But there are instances when we want to look at change over longer periods of time. When we're looking at the incident cases of COPD, for example, we want to have people who, across every risk period or every time, point in time. So again, longitudinal data analysis can help us do that. And the methods I'm gonna talk about today can also help us. And the final thing I'm gonna mention, and I think this is something that these models can do um, as with other longitudinal models, is that a lot of models or a lot of analyses, cross-sectional especially, um, assume that predictors remain stable over time. This analytic approach allows us to have predictors vary over time. And sometimes we want time variant predictors. So I'll talk about that conceptually. And then I'll talk about how to implement them in practice. Once you reshape data, it's really easy to create things like time variant covariates. So the real difficulty in these models is just setting up the data in a way to do the analysis. The analysis itself is actually not that complicated. So again, if you have questions, please feel free to interject. I tried to emphasize this at the outset, but I'll say it again. Not all longitudinal studies use the same statistical method. The statistical approach needs to be matched to the research question. If you have a research question, again, that's based on event occurrence, these methods can be very useful. If you have other things you're interested in, the, this, this workshop's great because there's lots of um, different um, methods being taught. One of those other methods might be preferable or preferable. Uh, Sigmund Willett overview um, statistical approaches often used for answering questions about change in event occurrence. I think their textbooks really an excellent one, something I learned from when I was a you know, master's and PhD student, but they really differentiate between questions based on change and questions based about, on event, event occurrence. So just to provide a bigger context of like other methods you might choose, if you're interested in questions about change, um, you're usually best, these are usually best answered using methods like individual growth modeling, multi-level models for change, uh, random coefficient regression, or mixed models. If your question is about event occurrence, thank you. I should know how to run these. I've been in a classroom in like five years with COVID. 
I'm definitely not a rental classroom. Um, so if you're interested in questions about change, some of these methods might be preferable. If you're interested in event occurrence, um, survival analysis techniques are usually very useful and event history analysis or discrete time models, which we're gonna talk about today, become important. And tobacco researchers, researchers are often interested in questions related to event occurrence. And some of the research we're doing is on smoking initiation. We have a manuscript on, um, we have a couple of papers on smoking cessation, and we have papers on the respiratory and cardiovascular health, come, health outcomes using tobacco products. It can also be useful in mortality studies. But if you think about your research question and what you're trying to answer, you'll get a lot of guidance into the method you should use. Again, these methods are useful when the outcomes are related to event histories, event occurrence. I'll talk about some of the weaknesses of that later on, but that's the basic starting point. And the reason we've been using these methods on quite a number of papers because of our outcome variable. And many longitudinal studies in tobacco research use data from the population assessment of um, tobacco health study. That's what we're using quite a lot. And the data is collected at discrete time intervals, either annually or biannually. I think wave four to five was two years. And I think, but I'm not sure that subsequent waves are gonna be done every two years. Right, so we have discrete data on a longitudinal data set, even though the con underlying continued or underlying processes are often continuous. And if you think about it, smoking cessation, which we're doing studies on, right, you can quit smoking at any time. We have midnight and a Friday, can be you know, three weeks from now. There's no discrete nature to the outcome, but we only collect the data, data at discrete time intervals. That's why we're using these methods. Right, if we had continuous outcome variable, we probably wouldn't be using these methods and I wouldn't be here today talking about why we can use these methods. And without continuous data, discrete time models have become increasingly popular in tobacco research. We're using them quite a lot. I see other articles coming out in the literature also using these approaches. So hopefully this is useful. Um, the goal today, I'm gonna to divide this workshop into two separate parts. I'm gonna start by providing a conceptual introduction and a little bit more detail to these discrete time models. Again what they are, what they're useful for, what kinds of questions are useful for answering. Um, I'm gonna very much frame this in a logistic regression framework instead of a survival analysis framework. So I'm gonna basically argue that these are just fancy logistic regression models. I'll then make like a bit of a link to, or to survival models at the end, but I think it's useful to, to think of the analysis that way because uh, it is, uh, because the data is discrete, I think it just makes sense. That's kind of how I was trained. I started with discrete models and then I went to survival. Our discrete, I started with logistic and then I went to these models before I'd ever learned about survival analysis. So there might be a bit of a preference there for me, but that's what I'm gonna basically argue. I'll show you analysis and our, our, I'll show you examples using both complementary log log link function, which is equivalent to, uh, or analogous to the Cox proportional hazards model. I'll also show you the results from our example using a logit link function, so logistic regression. You'll see the substantive interpretation of results are very similar. And for the most case, the results and the data that we analyze is very similar regardless of what link function we use. So I'm gonna do that for the first little while. Then we're gonna take a quick minute. I'm gonna start using my laptop. Well, I'll show you some code and um, the, the data and we'll, use a hypothetical example. I will say from the outset that my hypo, hypothetical example is probably not the best one for tobacco researchers because it's a little bit controversial, but the example is gonna look at the association between ends use and smoking cessation. When I made the slides, I probably should have like came up with a better, less controversial example. Um, this is a caveat and I'm gonna say it again when I go through some of the results. This is not a published example. It's not a manuscript that's been published. Um, it may not, live up to really close empirical inspection. So if people have really strong feelings on this, this is not a published example, but I'll show you how to set up the models, how to reshape the data, how to estimate them, and then how we can interpret them. So that's what I plan to do in the next little bit. Um, two hours, not a lot of time, but hopefully I can get everybody comfortable with the type of analysis and why we might use these models. Make sense? Right. So before I start, Couple of recommended resources I do have. I think everybody has access to the slides. At the end, there are, there are more references. 
but I really like these two books. The Singer and Willet book is a book that I kind of taught myself how to do some of the survival models from as a, as a graduate student. I think it's an excellent resource. It's written in a very accessible way. They have a really, really good um, a com like accompanying website with like state of code, R code, um, and SAS code, which I think is really useful. And it's written in a way that's meant to be accessible. Um, so if you want something that's well written, I highly recommend that. The second book um, is Generalizing the Regression Model by Blair Wheaton and Marissa Young. I took a couple stats classes with Blair, so I have a bit of a background. I think the book is also really well written, kind of covers a suite of different longitudinal methods you might learn in graduate school. It's a good introduction resource. Um, a lot of my slides are based fairly heavily on that chapter in his book, so I recommend that. But he also has all the code in SAS as well as Stata. So if people are SAS users, you might find this as a useful resource. The text is pretty expensive, so your mileage may vary if you wanna like look further into this. But this is like full disclosure, my own understanding of these methods have been heavily influenced by these books. I recommend them. I think they're good resources. You can probably find online versions through the libraries. I expect a lot of people know something about discrete time models. It's a little bit hard to pitch a two hour introduction when people are already fairly well trained. So I hope this isn't too low of a level. But again, the purpose here is to provide a substantive um, understanding of the models and why we use them. So to start discrete time models, um, our analysis is a technique of the analysis of a probability of an occurrence of an event at a given point in time. It can be applied to an event, that can, any event that can be dated and has a defined risk period. A lot of models that we estimate with path data, the onset of the risk period is actually the wave of follow-up, right? So if we're looking at smoking cessation, People will start smoking at very different points in times in their life. They're very different ages in the path data set. But we start um, tracking their cessation behavior once we have longitudinal data. So in some ways, the risk set becomes smokers at baseline predicting um, cessation at follow-up. Right? So we only have that kind of, um, you know, that's how we're defining risk. But again, this isn't the best way to do the analysis in a continuous time sense, because a lot of these people have smoked well before wave one of path. Right? They just didn't become smokers the year before at the same time. We're just looking at risk over time. But once we have data like that, we can think about these discrete time models. The risk period is defined by the onset of risk for the event we are interested in studying. And again, in the cessation sense, we're looking at follow-up waves of path. When we're doing things on COPD, for example, we're looking at people who don't have COPD at baseline, and we're looking at incident cases over time, and that's what we're modeling. Right. Again, there are people who have had incident cases well before wave one of path. Right? We're restricting those people out of the data set and constructing a risk period to start at wave two. And discrete time models are appropriate when we don't have continuous measure for outcome variable. And I've already stated that, but if you have continuous time data, I don't necessarily think you have to make it discrete, although we can have a conversation of the links between the two at some point in time. Um, discrete time models incorporate the time it takes for an event to occur. We're not just predicting whether someone will experience an event as you would in a logistic regression context, but what we're doing in this discrete time approach is we're examining uh, whether events occur and when the events occur. So when you're thinking about, should I do that, use this as my analytic framework, if you have a question where you're interested in whether the event occurs, yes or no, and you're interested in the timing of that event, then the discrete time models are really good. Uh, if you can't satisfy those two conditions, again, you might think about a different methodological approach to best answer your research questions. And these models show the onset, duration, and termination of a risk period for a defined event. So again, in the substantive example, for the second part of the class, we're gonna look at smoking cessation, and we're gonna look at the onset and, um, and duration of the risk periods. And the second point's important, and I've already kind of mentioned at the start, but we're also gonna look at the, or it also shows the time specific states of relevant explanatory variables associated with either the occurrence or non occurrence of the event. And if you think about it in our context, we have time fixed variables. So things like um, sex, age, race, and ethnicity, although they can vary over time, we often make them a static or a fixed models. We can also look at time specific states. So we can look at things that vary over time. So when we're looking at things like ends use exposures, we can look at how much people use ends 
um, in each wave prior to the outcome. So we can allow that value to change for individuals, which allows us to capture some of those change over time in our independent variables. And if you have something like cigarette intensity, for example, cigarette intensity will change from wave to wave. And it's important to sometimes capture that change over time. Again, these models come in either continuous or discrete time. Continuous time models assume that it can, an event can occur at certain or at any point in time. So the underlying logic of these Cox proportionate hazards models, you're predicting an event that can happen at any given point in time. Discrete time models assume that an event can only happen at occur at certain times and certain at certain times over time. These discrete time models um, often have an underlying continuous process associated with them. Like I said at the start, you can quit smoking at any point in time. We're defining smoking cessation as no past 30 day cigarette use for smoking cessation, plus the people self-identify as completely quitting smoking, right? That's, we're only looking at the last 30 days and it depends on when the data are collected, although it's an underlying continuous process. Um, because the most longitudinal data sets do collect data at discrete points in time, uh, the application of continuous time models is often difficult to carry out in practice. Because of that, again, discrete time models become an attractive alternative. And they preserve the information about the empirical distribution of risk over time. And that's really what we're trying to model. We're trying to capture this risk over time. And if you think about the basic logistic model, I'm not going to bore you with a whole bunch of formulas. I'm just giving a conceptual introduction here. But in the discrete time survival model, um, what we're doing is we're looking at the hazard rate of the individual. The hazard rate for the event is a conditional probability at each point in time. So it's the probability that an event occurs in, a, in an interval T for individual I, given that, the, uh, that it's not already occurred by the beginning of the interval T, where TI is the time of the event occurrence. So it's a conditional probability the event occurs. And because we have waves done in years and path, we're looking at this kind of conditional probability. We're adding the I and the T because it's longitudinal over time, but it looks familiar. It's just a probability. And because it's just a probability, what we can do is we can extend this probability to look at um, a logistic model over time. So this is a basic logistic model. You'll see that there's a couple changes to this model. The I and the T, the subscripts, they signify that the model studies the probability of an event at a given point in time. So we're looking at the probability over time. So again, basic logistic model with a little bit of detail. And the other thing to note is that the intercept, the A with the, under, the subscript T, what this says is, and why it's important, is that at each time interval, there may be different baseline probability of the event. In other words, a different hazard of the event at the given point in time. And we don't have an intercept in these models. You'll see in my code that at the end, I say no constant, because so I'm not giving a constant. What I'm putting there are the baseline hazards. And that's what we're modeling. Um, I'm not gonna make the models more advanced than that. Although I'm gonna mention it kind of towards the end of the um, presentation. Again, the hazard function, really what we're interested in modeling in these discrete time models is the conditional probability of a target event and thus the dust distribution of risk over time. Today, the hazard is a conditional probability that a person who smokes cigarettes will quit smoking at follow-up. In each time period, some respondents quit smoking, some respondents drop, drop out, right? They're lost at follow-up. So you'll have some individuals that respond to wave two of the path data that disappear, right? Those are right sensitive, they don't have the event. And that means that the risk set does change over time. So it's not as simple as just reshaping the data set so everybody has four rows of data. We're making it unbalanced. So we have people in the risk set where the time periods are at the greatest risk. And the denominator when we set the models like this is the number of smokers in the risk set at each time interval. The numerator becomes the number of smokers who quit smoking in each, not teach time interval, in each time interval. All right, so there's a couple of differences from standard logistic regression, but since I'm pitching it as a extension of logistic regression, here are a couple of ways that it's different. There are multiple intercepts for time in the discrete time model, one per risk period in the sample. These intercepts show the pattern of the hazard for, of the, for the hazard of the event over time. 
Each intercept stands or represents the log odds of the event at each discrete time interval. So we have that where we don't have that in standard logistic regression. And then the model is applied to a person period data set of observations. This new data set has multiple op observations for each person, equaling the number of risk periods that a person exper has experienced until they experience the event or until the end of the observation. And again, if the person drops out of the second wave of study, that's when they're right censored. If a person drops out after the last wave of the study, they're still right censored, but at the end of the study. Some of those individuals will quit smoking the day after the study ends. Some will do it a week later. Some will never do it. So they're all considered right censored in the way we set up the data. And so really the difficult part of this is really just reshaping the data. And I'm gonna show you how to do that with some of the code. And the person period data set is unbalanced because the number of observations for each individual varies. Individuals who have complete observations and didn't experience the event, well, in our example, we'll have three waves of follow-up because we're using past waves, path waves two, three, and four. Right? People are dropped from the data set when they experience the first event. That's the way that these are set up or until they're right censored. And I'll show you practically what this looks like. But those are the main differences. There are some issues with these discrete time models. These are just a couple of them. Um, the logistic model assumes that events only occur at discrete points in time. And again, there's an underlying continuous process um, where these events can occur. Um, events can technically occur at any point in time, but they're only measured at discrete time intervals. The logistic model suffers from a lack of invariance due to the length of time interval. And what this means conceptually is that if we change the unit of time, so if we're looking at months and we change it to years or vice versa, and we have a lot of data, um, it may make substantive changes to the model. Um, coefficients are not directly comparable across different um, interval lengths. And if the aim is to compare estimates to other periods, then invariance to interval length should be considered. If you're just trying to look at an event predicted by a bunch of independent variables, this isn't a huge violation of an assumption. That's something important to think about, um, especially this, these like the logit length function. And the final one is something that's becoming increasingly important to think about in um, the, uh, using the path data, which a lot of us are doing, is that the logit model assumes that the interval between measurements are equal to one another. So the timing intervals are equal. And again, in the path data, waves one, two, three, or waves two, three, and four were all collected roughly a year apart from each other. Now they're being collected two years apart, right? How does that compromise our models and what we're trying to do? I think it's important to think about and important to think about how we're gonna model the different kind of collection of the data. We can't control one path collects the data, but we do have some control about like some analytic decisions that we make. And the reason I mentioned these things is because um, there's a compelling reason I think to use the complementary log log link function, making it more like um, Cox proportional hazards models than using the logit length function. I've used both in some of our research. And again, I'm gonna show you some comparisons. The results aren't typically changing, but I think it's important to think about why you're using the model, why you're picking this link function versus the other one. Uh, this provides an analog to the continuous time survival model, like I've already said a couple of times. Estimates have a proportional hazard assumption built in. When you exponentiate the coefficients, you can interpret them as hazards ratios. So it looks very much in practice like a, uh, um, Cox model. It does not assume uh, interval equal intervals between measurement periods, so it's not violating that assumption. Um, and Allison in 2010 states that the logit and clog log link models rarely lead to different qualitative conclusions. But if you think that they might, I would recommend running it both ways and see if they're different. If they are, then try to anal try to figure out what's going on in your models to make them different. Um, but the main results today I'm going to show you, we'll be using the complementary log log link function. So that's what we'll show, but then I'll show, you know, comparison with the other models. So rarely does it make a big difference, but it's important to think about the assumptions of these models. I'm going to end the introduction part by talking about different extensions of the basic discrete time model, which I've described here just the last few minutes. These are things we're not going to actually do in the lab. But I think they're things to think about. They have implications for tobacco research. Um, I'm not doing anything fancy with the functional form of time. I'm just including it as, uh, as uh, in the risk model. I'm just including it in the model. I'm not doing anything with it. I'm not interacting with time. So I'm not trying to look at whether the exposure changes the function of time. And I'm also not changing the functional form of time. You can do all these things in discrete time models. 
And time can be modeled continuously, even in the discrete time context. And when you have a lot of waves of data or a lot of data, so say we had monthly data, we had a lot of it, we might be interested in modeling um, time in a different way. And so it has some conceptual appeals. I think in the path context, it still doesn't really make sense to do so, but we might think about doing these. And when you have a lot of data, I think this goes back to the point about discrete models versus continuous models. If you have a lot of data, the results often look pretty similar, whether you use discrete time models or continuous time models. But again, in this example today, we only have three waves of follow-up. We don't have a lot of longitudinal data, so we're not really doing much with the functional form of time, although you can. So as more data comes out or other data sets you might have, you may consider kind of advancing the basic model. Second extension is the competing risks model. Um, in this framework, all members be begin in one state, but we can extend these models to study one, one of several events occur. So think of the difference between like logistic regression and multinomial logistic regression. You might have a number of outcomes over time. And I've never done this, so I haven't put it into practice, but I do think about its conceptual importance. For example, we're looking at health outcomes, right? So we're looking at separately cardiovascular health, health outcomes, and we're looking at things like COPD and respiratory health outcomes. So that's what we're predicting. In a competing risks framework, you might actually have those things kind of considered together, right? In other words, tobacco is going to lead to health outcomes over the long, over a long period of time. And what happens first is important, right? Do you get respiratory disease first or cardiovascular disease? And if you set it up as a comp competing risks framework, I think you could set it up as no disease outcome and then have modeling as competing risks, kind of COPD and cardiovascular disease outcomes. So there's a way to like think about these things as competing risks and to conceptualize it differently that you might wish to do related to your research questions. Again, I'm not gonna talk about this today, but I think it's something worth considering. And the last um, extension that I think is important to think about for tobacco research is the multiple spell model. Events can be repeated and discrete time models can be extended to include multiple spells. So you can have people have more than one outcome, right? If you're looking at even a cardiovascular disease outcome, you might have a stroke at wave two and a heart attack at wave three. The repeated spells, how do you deal with this? Or more importantly for some of our research and a bigger assumption is if you're looking at smoking cessation, a lot of those people are gonna relapse, right? How do you build in the relapsers? You put them back in the data set and can you do that? And how does this look in practice? So the multiple spell model becomes important. And I think as time passes with PATH and we're doing some stuff on, um, we're doing stuff on um, smoking cessation, I think it's important to think about people who relapse and how they differ from people who don't relapse. Um, and we do try to do this in some of our research, but I think it's important to think about going forward. All right, so that's basic introduction. Yeah, sorry. For this uh, C log log function, can you, like in Cox models, you can control for like time varying covariance. Can you do something similar like that with this function? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And it's again, once we read. If you're like thinking of an analysis in, for example, youth or young adults who like say you take their educational level is changing over time, would you be able to account for that? Yeah, you can include as a time variant covariate. And I'll show you the example when we reshape the data. But when we reshape the data, it becomes really easy to implement these types of things much harder, I think, in the Cox context where you have continuous variables. But yeah, you can have the values change for each person. So, and my, I don't know if you want my like personal experience with these things. Once you include one time varying predictor, people want everything to time vary. And that makes sense, right? Because it's like, do things do vary over time, right? Your age varies over time too. Once you start allowing everything to time vary, then you get into like conceptual problems that you have to think about like, like mediators, how that's messing your models up and like me confounding mediators. So like, I think it's good to start simple. Say like, what's my key variable that's changing over time? Why do I want to do this? And when you can have a convincing argument that this should vary over time, I'd include them. But like an interaction, once you have once in a model, one in a model, everybody wants you to interact things. Right? It's like, it becomes like a bit of a slippery slope, but they're actually really easy to implement in practice, which is nice. So I'll show you an example. Um, some of this might be fairly um, basic. Again, it's a little bit hard to like calibrate to the audience, but I hope that you'll find this useful. So the example that I'm gonna do, and then I'll change over to Stata so I can show you actually the process in Stata. 
The example research question is looking at the whether e-cigarette use is associated with smoking cessation in a sample of adults age 25 plus who are established cigarette smokers a baseline. So I'm only looking at established cigarette smokers a baseline. Um, the data set, which hopefully you can open on your end, um, is just a, the path public data set waves one through four. I've eliminated most of like the extraneous variables just to make it simpler to look at. Um, I've done nothing crazy with the variables. I've renamed a few of them, um, but there's nothing crazy. There's 7,591 smokers at baseline. But I have not manipulated the data in any way to try to get a specific answer. I've not gone and like changed columns and rows and like values to make the results look a certain way. This is just the path public file. I renamed some variables and I made it smaller. And so that's the data you have. That's a question. I have the disclaimer in red. I realize that this might be a problematic example. Um, it's for illustrative purposes only. It's not peer reviewed and it might not pass the scrutiny of the class. And in fact, what I think we should be doing collectively as tobacco researchers is we should be finding an association like this and our job should be to try to make it disappear, right? Like we think there's an association, but what aren't we controlling for? We could make it disappear. So I think it's a good exercise to actually try to make these things disappear, give it stress tests. And if the results start to change based on what variables you're putting in the model, you shouldn't be overly confident in your results, right? And I'm not doing a lot of like sensitivity analyses for this example, right? Because I'm going to show you that e-cigarette use is associated with a greater odds or hazard of cessation of the next wave, but I've done nothing beyond that. Right? This is just an example. I have the data. I'm lazy. If I used other examples in the public use file, I would have had to recode more. So it's meant for illustration purposes only. I think you might make the argument, and I don't know if it will hold, that well, people who use e-cigarettes are more likely to quit smoking, they're all also more likely to relapse. And if that's the case, then we have to think about relapse and how that works into the equation. So again, it's only meant as an example, but that's what I'm going to work through and I'll show you how to do the analysis, which is the purpose of this. But uh, if you think that e-cigarettes don't lead to cessation, I'm not telling you you're wrong. This is just an example. All right, so with that in mind, we're going to talk about the data and the variables that we're going to look at in the data set. Again, we're using pass wave one through four. Adults, uh, we restrict the data set to adults who are age 25 plus a baseline, right? You could question this. We might actually want to look at all adults. These are looking at established smokers. Um, when I originally did the first analysis, we restricted adults age 25 plus because we wanted to make sure like education was fairly stable as a predictor. Our results in the, in the analysis that we published didn't change whether we set the restriction to 25 plus or 18 plus. We did the analysis both ways um, as a, a different exposure variable, but I, yeah, there's nothing nefarious in the way I've set this up. Um, we're looking at established cigarette users at baseline or based on their self-report of every day or someday cigarette use, they've smoked at least hundred cigarettes in a lifetime. So we consider these established cigarette smokers at baseline. We're tracking their cessation over time. And again, these models are looking at the, event occurrence of a single event, right? We're not having people who quit smoking more than once, although you can build them into the models. And if you're interested in doing this, we can have a discussion. The problem is with the replicate weights and how you have to restructure the model to allow people to go back in the risk set, but there's no reason you can't actually do it, right? To, to be included in this data example, you had to have at least one wave of follow-up data and complete covariate information. So I list-wise deleted people with missing information, Again, your mileage may vary whether you want to do this in the practice of your public, trying to publish a manuscript. But for full disclosure, that's what the analysis looks like. And I'm using the no miss command in Stata um, to make sure that the, the analytic sample size is exact same across models. So I'll show you that, but I'm just doing that to make sure that I'm list-wise deleting people. My outcome is 30 days cigarette smoking cessation. If you have the data set open, you'll see that the, the variable that we're going to end up using is called quit smoking underscore DV. This is a variable that I've created. Um, it's reporting no past 30 day cigarette use at follow up. So they're not currently using cigarettes in the past 30 day. Non current users are then asked the follow up question Have you completely quit smoking cigarettes? So I'm including that definition here. So it's people who haven't used in the last 30 days who have reported that they've completely quit smoking. All right. There's nothing, this is short term smoking cessation. You might want to change this to six months, you might want to change it to a year. But there's good reasons to do that. But this is, for example, purposes what I'm going to do. Um, 
For the time varying covariate, I'm going to use as e cigarette use. So I'm just going to show you how to make the time varying covariate. It's a binary in, um, indicator. So I was looking at as a yes if they report current e cigarette use who report using fairly regularly, and zero if they don't. So if you have people who say they use e cigarettes currently, but not fairly regularly, they get quoted as zero. Right. And the reason I'm going to show you this again is to allow it to time vary, which is the purpose of using this example. So people's e-cigarette use does change over time. Um, but I'm not looking at intensity of e-cigarette use. Right. So again, you might think about discrediting the results of my example by other variables. This is just a binary indicator, yes or no. It's included as a time variant covariate. I'm lagging this by one wave to ensure that e-cigarette use um, is happening in the wave preceding the outcome. So I'm just trying to like solve that problem of time ordering. That's why we're allowing it to lag by one wave. Um, so covariates that you have access to, and like, again, I just restricted the data set to make it smaller. We're gonna look at the effect of age. Um, so three age groups, the public use data, we don't have the continuous age variable. So it's just quoted in a very simple way. Um, sex, we coded as male and female. Race and ethnicity quoted as Hispanic, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic black, and non-Hispanic other. We have education um, set to, I think, three levels. So high school or less, no, under less than high school, high school or GED, um, some college or people who have completed college or had a greater level of education, just four categories, I apologize. Um, then we have a tobacco dependency Z-score. It's set up as a Z score, so there's a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. This is just to show you as what these multivariable models look like. So those are the covariates at baseline. Again, we're going to use multivariable discrete time survival models. We're going to do it, um, create an unbalanced person period data set. We're using generalized linear model framework. We're going to use the complementary log log link functions. We're going to get hazard ratios for the main models. We're going to look at results with uh, the logit link function again to show you what the differences look like. And the qualitative conclusions are very similar. Uh, for the main analysis, because we're often using path, I'll talk in like the path language. I'm going to use wave one replicate weights. So these are nationally representative of baseline. There are problems of using wave one weights in a longitudinal study, um, which definitely are an issue. Um, but that's the main analysis. I'll show you what the wave one waves um, weights look like. And I like this approach in some ways because there are people who drop out at different waves of the data set. So if somebody has a wave one, two, and three and disappears, right? If you're using the all waves weight and path, that person's excluded from the study, they recalibrate the weights and you carry on, right? So what they're doing is eliminated to people who have complete information over time. That's fine because they're calibrating the weights. They're not really dealing with selection. They're just making it nationally representative. And I think they're making big assumptions about the people who stay in versus the people who don't stay in. So this is my like, I, and I like the idea of including the information you have on people for as much time as you have them in the data set. So that's kind of my substantive argument for why I'm doing it. Um, we don't know why people drop out of these studies. We don't have a variable for that. If some people die, some, you know, the data set at wave one has people up to age 90 and that was five waves of follow-up. And every time there's another wave of path, there's more missing data. I think there's something like 52% of adults have completed all five waves of the data set. We're calibrating the weights. If you do a lot of these longitudinal analyses, um, you're gonna just look at the all waves weight, which means the people who can participate in all waves, which I think can be problematic. But what we've done as a solution, and it's an ad hoc one and probably not the, the best and probably will change over time, is we're doing sensitivity analyses. So we run the models with the wave one weights, right? The problem with the wave one weights are a, one big problem is it's nationally representative of a baseline, but there's a lot of people who never participate after they've been surveyed the first time, right? So you have like 1,300 people or something like that in the adult data set who never appear again, right? But they're somehow figure into like the weighting at, at with the wave one weights. We're not accounting for that. So a potential solution is to use the wave two weights, right? They're not even nationally representative. They're like, kind of like a pseudo national representative weight. But what it does is it makes sure that those people are in wave two, right? So now we're looking at people who are at least in wave two, different way to model it. And then the all waves cohort weights, another way to do it. I'm sure that there's like some weighting experts who can probably like think of ways to deal with the weights in a better way. And something we're also thinking about, but we are looking at the results of different um, sensitivity analyses. And I'll show you what they look like when we use different, you know, the analytic sample changes, the risk size changes, the risk set changes. 
So the substantive results mostly haven't changed with the things we've been doing, which gives us some confidence. The other reason not to restrict to the always cohort weight is that for a lot of our outcomes and things we're looking at like ends use, there's not a lot of ends users. And for some of our out outcomes like COPD, there's not a lot of people who have these health outcomes over time. And when we start cutting away people without complete data, we're actually further limiting our power and people in our risk set. So that kind of maximizes people when we use the maximal information. Um, but yeah, so if you have questions or comments, things you might, things we can think about, I'm happy to talk about it. But I'm just gonna show you three basic models. Um, E-cigarette use and time just by itself. The second model, I'm gonna add some social demographic uh, factors. And the third model, I'm gonna just add in tobacco dependence. And I'll show you what the results look like. Again, this is just to show you how the, how the stuff works. All right, so in terms of creating the steps for the analysis, it's actually quite simple. Um, we're gonna do a couple of things. First, we're gonna create sensor and duration variables. The sensor and duration variables are, once these are created, we're gonna use these variables to create the person period data set. So we're gonna restructure the variable based on those two variables, or the data set. Once we have the data set restructured, then the analysis is pretty easy. It's gonna look different. And I'll show you examples of why it looks different and like how to set up the data set, but we're gonna create that data set. And once it's created, you can then add time varying covariates to the person period data. And then we can conduct our discrete time models. So if you think of it in very, like, very simplistic cookbook steps, these are really the steps, right? You need to create a sensor and a duration variable and you need the information to create those variables, but we have them in things like path. Then we're gonna use that to create the person period data set. All right, and if you think back to the weather and when condition for survival models, the sensor variable is the weather condition. It's a dummy variable, one if the observation is censored and zero if the event occurs. So we're gonna create the sensor variable, right? Did the event happen, yes or no? So the weather condition, and then the when condition is the duration variable. This is the when condition. It's the time until two different things. Either the event occurs, then the person's removed from the data set, the way we structured these models, or until the number of periods of follow-up if the event does not occur. And again, you have people that are in wave one and two, which is great, and then they disappear, right? So they're only followed for two points in time. Um, you also have people who have, you know, complete data, which is great, but the risk set's going to be made up of those two things. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. And now I'm going to show you a little bit of code. I think I'm going to go through the next few slides, show you what the code looks like, and then I'll switch over to my laptop to show you, like, how to implement it in practice. Keep in mind that, like, this is simple state of code. There are many different ways to code things, and you can code... There's many different roads to roam. You can code the way that you see fit. This is just a simple example of how to create the sensor variable. I have a little bit more detail on this data do file, but I'll show you. What we're trying to do here is to create a variable for whether the event happened, right? So I'm just using, I'm generating a variable, um, creating a row total based on these three variables, um, completely quit smoking at wave two, three, and four. So I'm trying to see if they quit smoking at all over those three point times. So I'm just taking the row total. And if they score zero, they get a value of one, the event didn't occur. If they get one through four, the event did occur either at one of those three points in time. So I'm just creating a simple dummy variable. Again, simple way to code it. Other ways you can do it. I'm not gonna show any like, there's no like fancy coding in this. I'm not doing any like, like loops or anything. This is very simple. Create a sensor variable first. Once a sensor variable is created, right? This is what it looks like or should look like from the example that I'm gonna show you. Right, there's 7,591 smokers, um, 1,485 reported quitting smoking, and 6,106 reported not committing, um, quitting. All right, so that's what the variable is going to look like. So that's a sensor variable. Then you're going to create the duration variable. I, I call this uh, quit risk period. And I did it in two separate ways, and I'll tell you why I did it this way in a minute. Again, you can code these things in many different ways, but I started by I'm dealing with those who did not quit first, right? Um, so what I did is I combined, I have a variable called last interview wave, and that's the last interview that these people are followed up. So if they um, didn't quit smoking and their last interview wave was two, so the second wave of the study, 
um, they get a risk period of one. We follow them up for one wave at point in time, then those people disappear. We do it for the next two as well. So we're combining um, the sensor variable, looking at restricted to those who didn't quit smoking. Then we're looking at the last interview wave to get a value of one, two, or three. All right, so we create that variable. That's the first condition. The second one is looking at those who quit smoking. And again, we're only looking at the time until first reported quitting. So the reason I'm doing it this way is, at least in Stata, is the person quit smoke, quit smoke sensor is equal to zero, which means they did quit smoking. They, and they completely, completely quit smoking in wave two. As right, so this person completely quit smoking in wave two, that's how we're gonna code that person. They're gonna have a value of uh, one at wave two. And then it gets a little bit more complicated in a way because we're looking at time until first quit. What we're saying is they completely quit smoking. They didn't completely quit smoking in wave two, but they did completely quit smoking in wave three. Right? And then we do the same for wave four. So what we're getting there is a variable that looks like this. So it's, it's just a duration variable. There's values of one, two, and three. Now you might be wondering what the one, two, and three actually represent. You know that the total represents all the people in the data set, 7,591. At wave, uh, the value of one, what this means is that these are the people who either were right censored at wave two, it's their last interview follow-up period, or they completely quit smoking. If you combine those together, that gets you 1,213. The second one is 1,131, same logic. They either completely quit smoking at wave three, um, or they dropped into the data set, All right? And then the final one is everybody else in the data set, they either quit smoking at the last observation period or they didn't, the event didn't happen. All right? so it gets us to the right number of people, 7,591. And this is the variable that we're actually gonna restructure the data set based on. And if you think about how the data set should look conceptually, these three variables become extremely important. All right, I'm gonna show you that in a sec. Right, so if you look at this and we're gonna restructure the data set, and again, this is really the conceptually hard part of this analysis, and I don't even think it's that hard, but I'm gonna show you why this is important. So once we have these variables defined, we have the information we need to create the person period data set, the number of observations in the person period data set is calculated based on that duration variable, the quote risk period variable, um, which forms the risk set. So if you think about these individuals, right, the 12, 13, they either quit smoking at follow-up, the first follow-up wave, or they're right censored, right? So they're gonna have one row of data, right? The second group, the 1131, right? They're gonna, they either have two observations for each of those people. They either quit smoking or were right censored, right? So we multiply that by two. And then the remaining people have three rows of data when we restructure the data. You take that 5,247, multiply it by three. So when you create your person period data set with those variables, what you should end up with is a data set that has row 19,216 rows. But those 19,216 rows are coming because we're expanding this variable. Or does that make sense? So that's all we're doing. So that's how the restructuring of the data set should look. And fingers crossed it does, because otherwise it's a really crappy example. Um, but the code to do this also not very complicated. I can give you further resources if you want to see how to reshape it. Stata is one of the advantages of Stata. It's really easy to reshape data. If we're using like a balanced restructuring, we just create the variable and like reshape it so everybody has the same number of rows. Because this is unbalanced, it's a little bit harder. But you'll see there's not very much code involved. You can apply it with your own logic. You can use different commands. There's many ways to do this stuff. I'm going to use the expand command in Stata, and we're going to expand based on that risk period variable. So that's how we're going to expand the data set. A couple of preliminary notes that might be useful for some of you. We're gonna use episode splitting as the uh, way we're gonna do the analysis. Uh, we need to create subject ID before we expand the data. And I don't think you actually really have to create the subject ID variable. We have path identifiers. I hate looking at like really long path identifiers and trying to like tell them apart from each other because I'm not very bright that way. I create like one through 7,591. Like it makes, things easier for me personally. Um, then we're gonna use something like combining by and sort. So sort ID and by ID, if you use by sort, so it's a command you can use in Stata. Um, you can see, I'm gonna give like examples in the next slide, but like the generate sequence variable underscore N creates a new variable equal to the observation number. By sort, um, the 
we want to look at, we're going to use, create a new dependent variable based on the number of risks per period. And then we're going to create a sequence variable, which is going to be used for our baseline hazards. So there's a, like a little bit of background to like what we're going to do. This is an example of the code. It's very much what's in the example do file that I'm going to give you. Um, and again, I'm just sorting by person ID. I'm generating ID equals underscore N. So everybody's getting their own ID, which is nice. It's like, again, it's done for simplicity purposes. We have a path identifier, but I find that easier. And then the expand variable is the important one. Cause again, we're expanding that quit risk period. We've already defined it, right? So we're gonna expand based on that. So the next row, and I try to create like some notes in here to like, hopefully give you some examples. We're gonna create a wave identifier for each subject and the binary dependent variable. So by sort ID generate seek bear equals underscore N. Again, we're creating a sequence variable um, for each individual subject. And then we're gonna buy sort IG. This generate quit smoking DV, that's a dependent variable. The variable that I give you in the, the wide version of the data is quit smoking, right? So it has two different conditions. It's like if they quit smoking equals one and they're like underscore, underscore N is equal to the big N, then it's gonna be equal to one. Everything else is gonna be equal to zero. So this is creating a dummy variable. Um, that's a variable we're gonna use for the discrete time models. You're gonna see how it looks. I'll show you an example when we recode it. And then at the end, I'm generating D because that sequence variable is like uh, um, the wave two, wave three, wave four, it's together. I just created three separate dummy variables and that's just code to do it in Stata. We don't use Stata. So that's all I'm doing. Recreate the person period data set and we'll do it in a minute in, with my laptop. But then what the data is gonna look like is it's gonna be reshaped, right? And if this is your first like time thinking about longitudinal data, maybe it's a little bit like not entirely clear. I'm gonna just show you an example. This is the five, fir first five respondents from PATH. So the far left column, you're gonna see I have their ID number, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Um, the sensor variable, right? One is censored if they didn't quit, um, zero, they did quit. The risk period, how many times they were followed up. And then they have the follow up one, two, three, so the waves, and then whether or not they quit smoking. So we look at the first person, there's three rows of data. Right. What this means is that this person was followed at three waves, right? Wave two, wave three, wave four, they didn't quit smoking. So their dependent variable cessation, which is equal to that variable that I just created, is zero, zero, zero for those three rows. The second and the third person both quit smoking at wave two. So there's only one row of data. They followed one wave, they quit smoking. Right. For first and four, we have three waves of data. We followed them up at three waves and they reported quitting smoking at wave four, right? So wave three is zero, wave, or wave two is zero, zero, wave three is zero, wave four is one. So that's what the data set very much looks like. Person five, again, a non-quitter, right? They quit, they continued smoking at wave two, three, and four. We have three rows of data. So there's three different rows, right? So our, now we're 7,591 people in the data set. Now we're expanded, there's 19,216. And this is the way the data set looks. Right, again, the hardest part of the data set is doing that. And once you have the data set created, you can create some time varying covariates. And here's a really simple example. It's a binary indicator. And what we're doing is just simply using the sequence variable to create this, to create this variable. So we generate the variable equals to blank, to missing. We, we replace it equals to one. If they are established e-cigarette users that wave one, if their sequence variable is equal to one. This is a little bit like confusing because the way it's a Steve Cook coding problem, but sequence variable means um, seek var. Um, I'm I have it set up so seek var one is like the first follow up wave, which is really wave two, right? So it's only one two three, but it's actually two three four. So the reason that this is lagged is because I'm looking at wave one. I'm using their wave one e-cigarette value. If, C, if the seek bar equals two, which means the, the second observation period. So that makes sense, so it's already one behind. Um, yeah, probably not like the nicest way to code it, but that's how I've created the variable. So I did for each of those three waves of follow-up. And I don't have an example to show you how this changes over time, but e-cigarette use is a good example for a time variant covariate because people's e-cigarette use does change quite a lot, right? So you don't want to make it static, right? You don't allow it to change over time which we do the last little bit after three, like the last three, four rows, three rows, is I'm using the previous wave. If there's missing information at wave two, I'll use wave one value, right? And the only reason I'm setting it up this way is to make sure that the, 
independent variable happens before the outcome variable. People have missing information at each wave, not a lot, but I'm actually, so if somebody doesn't have any values at wave two, I'll use the wave one information, right? Is that the best solution, right? Maybe not in all contexts, but that's how I've set up the code here for the example. And then time varies. So if I were to add another row to this past the station, which I probably should have done with e-cigarette use, you'll see the values of e-cigarette use for some people would be zero, zero, zero. You know, person that used e-cigarettes at all three waves would be one, one, one. Somebody that didn't use, didn't use and use would be zero, zero, one. So it's set up the same way, it's just time varying, right? But once you time vary, yeah, question. Right. Correct. And yeah, whether that's a good example, and it's hard with some of these variables to measure them each year. And once we start lagging variables, we or and it's probably not right to use the word lag. I'm using like the previous wave. You're like time series analysis would be like you shouldn't use the word lag. You're probably right. I was using like from the previous wave, but you think we only have one year, and a lot of behavior changes in a year for e-cigarette use. So we're assuming that the previous year's exposure will predict the next wave's outcome. And because there's a year between those observations, that's not very precise. And when you start lagging things, the effects become smaller because you're like the distance between exposure and outcome are greater. The reason that I'm doing it for this research, especially with e-cigarettes, is because um, it's hard to cessation because for different reasons, but e-cigarette use for like disease for example, if you don't lag it and people start using e-cigarettes after they get diagnosed with a cardiovascular disease, so a person's a lifelong smoker, they find that they have a heart attack and they start using e-cigarettes, and it all happens in one period. If you're not looking at the, the exposure from the previous wave, you could have reverse causation. But recognize that every time you like draw on data further in the past, you're losing precision, right? Because it's discrete time intervals. So again, for this example, just an example, but. I think it's important to think about these things and what we're actually doing when we make these associations and try to make strong inferences on our data. All right, so I think I'll show you some results. This is like the basic life table. We can, maybe we'll go back to this at the end. Um, I should maybe I'll do this now and then show you the code. Does that make sense? So this is a basic life table and let's put this information up here. Um, I'm just looking at the time until first smoking cessation at waves two through four, the risk set, remember I've said number, a number of times that the risk set is slightly smaller here. Instead of 7,591 people, I have 7,557. That's because this is of like a multivariable data set. I list-wise deleted the other people. So the risk set becomes slightly smaller. And if you minus 7,591 from 7,557, that's the number of people I excluded list-wise. That's why it's a different number if you're wondering. Um, so the risk set is 19,148. But the variables we're interested in in terms of timing until these events happen is the cessation time. 636 people quit smoking between wave one and wave two, first wave of follow-up. 487 at the next time interval and 353. The number of people who quit smoking is 1,476. So that's the number who experienced the event. Um, the people who are censored. So if you think about this in like basic life table logic, right? If you minus 7,500, 57 minus the people who quit and minus the people who are censored. That's the number of people who should be in the risk set of the next wave of follow up. Does that make sense? Um, and if the math doesn't work out, it's probably like a, me entering the data wrong issue, um, but it should work out. And it gives us the people who've been censored. So if we use the all waves cohort weight, it's not quite this simple, but the people that we're losing information on are the 566 people censored at wave, after wave one to two the 632 people censored at the next wave, right? Because those are people that we have information on, but not complete information on. So a little bit more complicated than that, but it's, um, so the, but it's very close. Then the hazard estimate is the um, hazard at each point in time, like 8.8% .8 of the people at risk quit smoking after wave two. These are using the weights, by the way. So it's like the weighted um, hazard, 7.6% between wave two and three and 6.8% of the next wave. So if you think about the average annualized cessation is 7.9%, right? So that's just a basic life table, kind of what the data looks like when you start to think about it in terms of like a survival approach. Now I'll show you this and then we can go and uh, like look at the data set a bit. 
But in terms of like the three models I said at the start, we're going to look at, I'm looking at um, the 7,557 people, the same risk period. I'm using the wave one weights here. Model one, all I'm including is the effect of time, which I don't show you, but that's the baseline hazard and our time varying covariate ends use predictor. And you'll see the hazard is 1.45, statistically significant, right? So I'm saying that ends use at the previous wave is predicting cessation of the next wave. Again, not necessarily um, you know, published valid example, but that's what the results look like. Then you look at the other covariates when we add them, they kind of make sense, I think. Um, Non-Hispanic black individuals are less likely to quit smoking and it's significant. Um, in terms of education, people with some college or college or more, more likely to quit smoking, model two, which I think makes conceptual sense. And then in model three, I'm exact same model, but I'm adding in tobacco dependency as a, as a Z score. And it's significant. People who are more dependent, less likely to quit smoking, which makes sense. We are not changing our exposure variable, right? It's still significant using wave one weights. And that's just kind of what the basic models look like. Um, then I'm gonna, maybe we can go back, back to this later. This is just comparing the results. You guys have the notes there. Um, the Left-hand side, logit link function. So one point, the adjusted odds ratio, and this is just the multivariable models is 1.53. If I use the complementary log log link function, those are the results look like. So comparing them models side by each or side by side, if you will, those are the results look like. You'll see that the results aren't changing substantively, right? And we spend a lot of time thinking about this, like what happens if we use a different link function? What happens if you set the weights to something different? Are results changing substantively? And for the most part, they're not. So that's just showing you that example. The second sensitivity analysis is comparing the models using the wave one weights, the wave two weights. So again, left-hand column, wave one weights, right-hand column, wave two weights. And again, results not changing much. The number of people change. The number of people are changing largely as a function of who's in the data set for the weights, right? The wave two weights means that the person has to be present at wave two. And so the, the sample size is smaller eliminates some people. The results very similar. We can come back to this kind of at the end. Oh. Somewhere along the lines, I have the all waves cohort weights. Um, I can show you the results of those as well. All right, any questions on any of this? And I can show you the code. Yeah. You said this earlier and I missed it. When you refer to wave one weights and wave two weights, are you referring to the sample weights or the replica weights? I'm referring to the replica weights. Okay. So we're using, and I'm going to show you in the, the analysis that we're using replica weights um, for all the analyses, which is pretty easy to do in Stata. Replica weights make some analyses quite a bit harder and you can't do everything using the replica weights in Stata. Um, but yeah, good question though. Yeah, of course, yeah. Good question. I think it depends, then you have to diagnose about why the results are very different. I think you can expect different results if the hazards are really, really high. There are contexts where the, the results will differ. I've never experienced a big difference between the two different models to date. If I did, I would think about why, whether or not we're like estimating an underlying continuous process, whether, and I'd probably use complementary log log instead of logit, but I, I haven't experienced it. I'm sure there are good examples when they've happened. Yeah, of course, yeah. Good question, I'm not sure, um, but I think we do have some missing data issues and we're thinking about like multiply imputing some data like pack years values. I think it's important to like do this going forward. So very good question. Um, I, I, I expect you can, but I've not personally done it. All right, we're just gonna take a second to switch this over. Messages run out. Okay, great. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Ooh.
Instagram. Use Zoom all the time. I think it should be fairly easy to. All right. All right. Perfect. All right. So everybody has access to. Everybody has access, I think, to the, the code and the, the data. You can see the data file. Um, people aren't familiar with data. It's, um, I set up the directory. Um, you'll note that I have like the backslashes are different in a Mac and a PC. So if you have trouble opening the thing, you might have to set your directory a little bit differently to get the data. You can also just open the data and copy and paste all the analysis into the Stata box if you want. So it doesn't really matter. This is just gonna show you some of the data I don't know if you can see the screen. I guess you have your own versions, um, but. I'll make this work. I might have to stop sharing for a second. So I've kind of already gone through the code. I can show you what the code looks like here. You look at the data for a little bit, show you how to recode, reshape the data, go back to the slides to make sure we did things right, but hopefully everything matches up. Um, again, if it didn't, it's a very poor example on my part. Hopefully you can see this, the screen. Um, this is a little bit of uh, stated code. Again, each of these steps is created along the way. Um, I have the data directory, which you know might change depending on where you have your data set. But if, once you link your data, you can just run this, these models one at a time. You'll see that I created some variables. First thing I did is created a sensor variable. Again, step one, sensor variable. I've already managed and cleaned the data a little bit. So I'm not giving you, you know, a lot of the background code to create all the individual covariates. Just giving you the variables just to show you how the reshaping function works. First thing I did is create, again, the sensor variable. Just created an egen variable based on the row total of those three variables to get whether or not it, it quit smoking. If you don't like the sensor variable being coded as like opposite to what you're used to, um, an interesting and easy thing to do in Stata is to use a squiggly line in that variable, which just makes it upside down, it reverse codes it. So then that makes it like the variable that you're used to, which is just quit smoking instead of censoring. It's the exact same thing. Um, if you don't believe me, there's a correlation between the two variables. So you can see they're the exact same. Um, but, Really, they're just like the same variable upside down. So I did that first, created the duration variable. Again, we went through the code, risk period. I just copied and pasted this to PowerPoint. So it's creating a risk period of one, two, or three. Then I create the unbalanced person period data set, which here is just uh, exactly what we went through in class. The tab seek var generate D just creates three separate dummy variables for the sequence or for the um, baseline hazards. I do that I for slide 37. So I tried to put in like the slide where the information is. So if you wanna go back and forth, you can kind of compare them. I think it should be slide 37 if I updated my PowerPoint, my this for the PowerPoint. All I did here is list the uh, variables for um, rows one through 30, which were, was where I got the first five respondents information. Um, 
but that's just listing the variables, look at the data set. When you restructure, you can see there's the right number of people in the data set, which is what we want. All right, and then I created the time variant covariate, which we also went through. Um, you can check the variable. So I just sorted and then browse to see if they matched up to each other. You can also list them to see, make sure they work the way you expect to. But when I did that, I just saved the data set as something else as a longitudinal data set because the wide version of the data was 7,591 cases has now been flipped. So I'd save the data as something else at that stage. And then when you have it set up, then you can do your analyses. And I think because a lot of us are using path and we're using these types of models, I think it's useful to like look at the code a little bit. Um, do you want me to make this bigger? Useful? I'll zoom in. Five years ago, I had spectacular vision. Now I don't, I have to use reading glasses. And it's, now that I use reading glasses, it's like gone downhill very quickly. So I need to make things bigger. I used to make fun of my friends for like having like big text on their phone, like the size of the text. Mine is now very big. So I'm very empathetic towards people who um, want things zoomed in because I definitely need them zoomed in. All right, so I create the variables and I'm gonna show you because a lot of us are using path, like I said, right? When I say I'm using baseline weights, which is a question somebody had, what I'm using are these replicate weights, but I'm using the wave one P weight and then the 100 replicate weights. Right, so I'm SPY setting the data. I'm saying that those are the weights I'm using for my analyses. And that's for the main analysis, what I'm doing. So I set the baseline wave one weights. The mark no miss thing, this is just like, there's other ways you can do this, but because I'm like building models where like variables get added in subsequent models, I wanna make sure that the data set doesn't change. So I'm just creating a variable and I'm calling it, I'm marking out no miss based on the independent variables in the multivariable model. And then I'm tabbing no miss. So this is like, so I'm putting no miss as like uh, in the if statement in the model. So it has the exact same sample size regardless of the models I run. So this is how I'm dealing with solicitized deletion. Um, again, there's other ways you can do this, but when you're creating models and there's like the sample size changes, this is creating so all the sample sizes are the same. I create a Z score based on the tobacco dependence measure that I gave you in the data set. So it should have a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. And Stata for some reason likes to give you like, like some kind of weird error, ter error term with like lots of things at the end. But yeah, it's, I think it's right. But so we're creating that variable. And then th slide 39, the life table. If you think about like basic survival analysis and how you create your life tables, Right, you're using like life table, like the survival analysis commands. But because we've reshaped the data, we can get the hazard at least with weights. And the problem for our analysis is the weights. We want the weighted hazard. We can get that by using um, the row total of the, of the data set. So it's making like a cross tab essentially. So all I'm doing here is I'm using the replicate weights, which is a SVY to survey Sweden's data. BRR equals, so I'm using the replicate weights comma, subpopulation, if no miss equals one, so that's getting me the right sample size of 7,557, I think. Then I'm tabbing sequence variable by the quit smoking DV. And I'm asking for the row, um, to, to do the row total, I'm getting the, the observations, and I'm making the format so we can see all the numbers. All right, so that's all I'm doing to get that baseline hazard. It, we should be able to do it, and there's a way to do it using the regular survival stuff, but you're not gonna get the weights for the hazard, the right, right? It's gonna be unweighted. So this is the reason I'm doing it this way. So you can see that, um, yeah, so slide 39, that's what the information is. Uh, hopefully that's like useful. In terms of the code for discrete time models and the different length functions, right? The main analysis I'm using complementary log log, so it's clog log. So what I'm doing here is I'm doing the same thing. Uh, the only restriction is if no miss equals one, using the replicate weights, um, which are already set up above. And I'm doing um, clog, log, log, my dependent variable, D1, D2, D3, that's the sequence variable. So that's like the baseline hazard. And I'm including my time variant covariate. And then I'm asking for no constant because I don't have a constant. I have the um, D1, D2, D3 representing the risk over time to the probability. And then I have E form to like exp exponentiate the coefficients to give me a hazard ratio. That's all the code is. Right? And then this I'm adding different variables. Right, so if you see the code's pretty simple, this clog log is the link function. Below, if you go down to line, um, uh, 
Oh, there, the, if you go down the line, like 180, 172, 173, you'll see the, the slide 41. You'll see I'm doing the same thing here, but the code's a little bit different. I'm using like GLM for general linear models is my link function. And then at the end, I have the logit link and then I'm exponentiating it again. So it's like very similar. The results are kind of the same. I didn't do a lot of like anything fancy with the results. These are just like very much how I ran the models just to show you how you might use the different um, link function. If you're interested in like doing a logit model versus a um, complementary log log model. The first paper we published in this, we used the logit. I used like the logit link function and that's how we published the paper. It was published in 2021. I've had lots of people ask me why I've used that and not complementary log log. There really isn't a real good answer, except that the results are almost identical. And that's just how we started doing the analyses. But since then I've been using complementary log log. So I feel like people could like see like different things I've done and be like curious why I'm changing things, but there is no real reason. Just, uh, yeah, so the results are the same. So that's how you'd estimate it in both um, contexts. The weights itself, which I think are, um, you know, change. You want to see if the weight, changing weights matter. Slide 40 is the main model, the logit link function, using wave two weights. And I'm not sure why I don't have the all waves weight here, but we can add it. The numbers go, the sample size goes down. But we're just changing what the weight is. And again, it's going to change our risk set. It's going to change things. If the results start to change, we should be wary. Um, so in terms of code, that's really it. Do you want me to go through and actually show you the analysis? I don't know if people have questions pretty early. Yeah. A state of working on your computers? It's not working on mine and it's asking for a password. I don't know about him as mine. Okay. Um, but what I was going to ask is if you could actually like, show us the data set instead of sure, yeah. before and after you make the changes to format between. Sure. All right, so this is the data set. I see a couple errors up top because I didn't, I changed the working directory for my file. It wasn't opening. So yeah, not the best case scenario. This is what the data set looks like. And if you just type into the command line, even ED, is that showing, that's not showing up there. So this is like the data set that I gave you. So everybody should have access to this data. Nothing magical here. Just like, this is what the data looks like. But I want ED because I'm just going to like show you like the actual data. All right, there's 7,591 individuals. The variables we have, like those are all weights and stuff. So that's like the size of the data set and what it looks like. Um, in terms of... Doesn't like me to uh, show different things in the desktop, do this. Right, so that's back to the data set again. For people who don't use data and don't have a lot of familiarity, you shouldn't assume that people really know this stuff. Um, state is relatively simple to use, just like it looks like a regular spreadsheet. And I have you know, my command line here where I can type things in. I can also use a do file, which I just showed you the example of. And then on the right-hand side, those are all the variable names. So you can see like the person ID, if you use path, some of these will be familiar to you, all the weights information. Um, these are the variables that I gave you. So if you wanted to look at like education recode, for example, what that variable looks like, I could show you this, right? That's just what the variable looks like um, for those things. Right, there's some missingness. So you can see like where I got the missingness from for the independent variables doing this. Um, so that's the, the variable. If I type missing after, 
you can see those 13 people who are missing. I told those people are going to be listwise deleted. Again, an analytic decision I made. But uh, for, for the example, you know, age group, for example. So this is just like what the data set that I gave you, what you have access to, looks like. Um, there's one person missing for that. So you can see there's like the basic variables. The actual outcome variable. Wave two, this is like the 648 people who quit, 640 people who quit smoking. Uh, these are the people we have information for. Wave two, there's people who are missing. All right, so this is like what the data set looks like. And if you want, I can show you what the data set looks like once we've like reshaped it. So I think that's the question you want, what you want to see, right? All right, so this is basic data set. So I'll close that and I'll show you. Uh, what the reshaped data will look like. All right, so this is gonna be what the data looks like. Again, we can do the same thing. I'm probably gonna have to unshare to show you this actually. Um, first. So I have 19,216 people in the data set, the people who have quit smoking and haven't quit smoking, kind of broken down by the quit smoking variable. The data set's bigger. So if I showed you the data set, just the number of rows that equals 19,216. Um, the dependent variable that we're using for analysis is the one that we've created, which will be this one. All right, so there's a difference between these two variables. That's just the did you quit smoking variable. Remember, we're looking at timing until first quitting smoking. And so you have people who have like report quitting smoking multiple times. So it's gonna be a little bit different. This is the actual variable we're modeling in our analysis, which is the one we created when we reshaped the data. Um, correct. So we're looking at the time until the first event. And again, you can make these multiple spell models where you have people come back into the data set. And I think that there's like an important, that's important, um, but it becomes more complicated, especially with the replicate weights. Um, but yeah, that's what the variable will look like in that context. Um, I've given, I've provided the weights, yeah. Okay. So they're all there. And so if I, I'm gonna copy and paste, and just to make sure everything's weighted with the right weights, I will run a bit of the code just so you can see how it looks. And so you can just copy and paste things. I'm using uh, replicate weights and the Fay. Point three is like a path recommendation of like how to set up the SPY command. So I've set it up there. You can see um, the information. So I just like use that's what the wave one weights will look like. And then if you want to like see like the multivariable model, for example, I'll show you that as well. That'll be like what's in slide 40 in your slides. Model C. Copy and paste that. Again, this is just complementary log log, the same thing that's in your code. So I'm going to run this. And I'm not talking a lot about like the underlying mechanics of how these methods work, but the, the underlying math for complementary log log is a lot more complicated than the logit models. And you can tell by how long it takes models to run. And when I first started doing logit models, instrumentally, the models run much faster when you use logit. So one of the reasons I was like pure laziness on my part 
Um, but you'll see it'll take a few seconds because it's using the replicate weights to run. Um, so that's all it's doing is thinking. So for this analysis, like most longitudinal analyses and probably most analyses we all do, um, time man or um, data management is where most of the work comes in. And so like we spend a lot of hours doing data management to run a model and a final model and lots of time like looking at sensitivity analyses and stuff. So I haven't done a lot to show you what I've done behind the scenes, but there is a lot of like, that's where most of the work comes in is reshaping the data as like conceptually takes a bit of time to think about. But once that's done, it becomes quite simple. Yes. Um, for those who are not Stata users, do you have any similar examples or do your colleagues have any examples in SAS that you could share? So I have the textbook I recommend. Both those textbooks have SAS code. The Winger, Sillen, Singer and Willett book has for each chapter all their code and like SAS, R, and Stata. And you just look it up, which is nice. Um, and the other book that I recommend that's up there, they have their examples are in SAS, I think in the actual text, which is quite nice. So I would recommend that. And I think we have colleagues who are using SAS. I could probably find some SAS code, but there is stuff available, which is nice. It's nice to have a resource to like. Yeah, especially, I mean, since many of us use SAS, it'd be nice to have an example in SAS with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And yes. Are uh, using what sort? Oh, we repeated cross-sectional. Um, well, you're gonna have different people, yeah. right? So you're in this analysis, we're linking, we're looking at like individual events over time. So this would be repeated cross-sectional, be a bit different. Um, but you can, yeah. So I would use something different for repeated cross-sectional. But um, yeah, just because we're looking at individuals, we have an outcome, we have multiple observations, we're looking at the time until outcome for an individual. That's why we're restructuring the data that way. Um, repeated cross-sectional stuff, you can do, you can like append data sets, look at things over time. I know there's, you can do more, if you have enough data, you can do much more complicated analyses. But with this, we're restricted to looking at individuals and the timing until event. Again, it's interesting, right? Because we all have different, research questions we're seeking to answer, a lot of us using path data, right? Again, it goes down to like whether or not this is the best method to use based on the data you have. Um, so this is what the model looks like when I use um, the path data. So like I showed you a table, this is what it actually um, gives you. So the D1, D2, and D3 are again, the baseline hazards. Uh, no constraints on time, not doing interactions with time. It's very much like the main effect of time. Um, I think you can complicate these models quite a lot, especially as more path data becomes available to ask more refined research questions. Of course, you have some limitations and like depending on the variables you have, you know, the, the number of people who experience events, for example, you can, there's some limitations, but that's what the model looks like in Stata. So you can see, I, um, yeah, does that makes sense. I do have like one or two slides to go through at the end, just like to talk about conceptually what we're doing. Um, maybe I'll just continue using this laptop. I'll close this. I won't say that. So let's show up, this is the same slides that you have access to. Again, that's what the person period data set's gonna look like, the number of observations. If people wanna see what the results look like with the all, waves weight. I think I have them in the data set. You can look if they're, the right weight, weights aren't there. I can add them and send them out. Again, I'm not trying to, uh, I was laziness at that point for me, but I can definitely show you that. Um, but I want to end just by spending a few minutes because a lot of it's using path. 
a lot of us are doing these like longitudinal analyses. I think it's good to have some like collective wisdom. We should have like meetings and the odd beer with each other to think about these things and about the models we're running. Um, I want to end by talking about um, some important um, considerations when using the path data set, right? And this is like some of the things we're thinking about as we're doing research, right? Specifically for the first point, the short duration of follow-up, we're restricting out people who've experienced events previously, right? So when we're looking at health effects, we're getting rid of all the people with respiratory disease at baseline, and we're looking at incident cases over time. And as you'd expect in a data set of, you know, 32,000 adults, but we're only looking at age 40 plus for COPD, for example. So I got the sample down to under 20,000 and then people drop out. We're not talking about a lot of people experience the event over, over time. We only have three waves of follow-up. Now we have four, right? So we're only looking at incident cases across four waves of follow-up. We do have a relatively short duration of follow-up in our study and it makes it hard to run some of these models. You have to think about what we're trying to do you know, some of our research on the um, effects of tobacco or tobacco and ENDS products, for example, we're only looking at the effects of ENDS for like three years. ENDS products have only been in the tobacco marketplace since 2007 in the US. There's not a lot of exposure time. And for something like COPD, which takes, you know, years of chronic exposure to toxicants to lead to, to, to compromised respiratory functioning, we need longer term data. We shouldn't expect that you know, two years of exposure to ENDS products is going to lead to COPD. And when we're making, running these analyses, we should be aware of the fact that we only have a few waves of follow-up. The way we're setting up our data is such that we're looking at incident cases. We should keep these things in mind. Um, so it's a fairly obvious point, but we don't have long-term follow-up. It's hard to know what the downstream consequences are going to be. I think when we're writing about these things, it's something that as we've written manuscripts, right, we don't have enough data to make big statements about the effects that these things may have in the future, especially with tobacco products as they change in the marketplace and continue to evolve. So we should be very like circumspect about like the conclusions we're drawing with a, with a data set that only has a short period of follow-up. The second point is about attrition. Longitudinal data sets all have problems of attrition. Not everybody participates in all waves and there's problems with selection. Like what is it about the people who continue and participate in every wave versus the people who aren't who are dropping out over time? What's going on with attrition? Informative censoring is if you're, you know, if they're dropping out because they're, they're getting COPD and dying and you're looking at COD, COPD is your analysis. There's a problem with your models. Um, and the best thing I can say in terms of like the path analysis is to be careful and do sensitivity analysis. You can do analysis, to, uh, attrition analyses, try to look what's going on with people who drop out of the study, try to use different weights where people are in and out of the data set. But there is attrition. We shouldn't pretend that it doesn't exist. I don't think we should pretend that the all waves cohort weight just magically solves the attrition problems. Because again, they're calibrating the weight, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they're making the weight nationally representative. But they're not dealing beyond the fact that they're making it look like the population. They're not dealing with why people aren't participating in a follow-up, which means that we're not really dealing with attrition. But we care about, you know, how we, whether it's nationally representative a lot, which we should, we don't always think enough about the problems of attrition and all longitudinal methods. We should think carefully about the process of attrition. Um, I can tell you if, like anecdotally from like our stuff, tobacco smokers drop out of, like cigarette smokers drop out of the study at greater rates than non-cigarette smokers, right? And the, the weight will adjust for that because they oversample smokers, that's important. But ENDS users um, aren't dropping out disproportionately high to non-ENDS users, right? If you think of it like the socio-demographic profile of ENDS users, especially in the 40 plus population, the adult, the older adult population, they're not dropping out at really high rates. So is there attrition problem with the ends exposure variable, right? These are things that I think you have to do analyses on and to think about, but with all longitudinal analyses, attrition is a problem. And I think it's something to be mindful of. A statistical power and exposure time, our outcomes, our exposures, a lot of variables don't have that many people in them. And we've got some criticism on our ends use variables because there's not a lot of ends users, especially in the older adult population. Most of those ends users are either current or former cigarette smokers like almost all of them. So to try to look at the independent effect of ENDS use, 
without there's not enough people to look at like end users who never smoked right in the path data there's very few of those people especially in the older population so it's hard to model that um, we don't have a ton of power it's a limitation so again when you find a non-significant finding i think it's important to be circumspect and note the real limitations of um, power and how that could impact your analyses to, to observe a significant effect i think again it makes sense but because these topics have uh, a lot of controversy i think it's important to be explicit like we do have limitations with this i will say is like the counterpoint is that there aren't a lot of ends users in the adult data set and there, we're not finding effective ends on a lot of the outcomes um which it could be a power issue but in the youth data set we have very few cigarette smokers but we're finding really strong effects with other diseases right so again there's the same power problem there's not many ends users but they're still finding a significant effect so um, take with that what you will, but uh, that's something to think about. I think when we write up our results, when we share our results with the scientific community, we should be very circumspect, very cautious because there are limitations with path data set. That's a huge data set, it's great, but when you start to divide up analyses, and then if you're trying to look at like certain subgroups and do interactions, the models are like, you do have cell size problems. Uh, weights and representativeness, you can see like our approach is like kind of a, probably not a very precise one, but we're doing a lot of sensitivity analyses, but you know, using wave one weights for a cohort study, is that the best method? Maybe not, all waves weights might be better. Again, they adjust for um, the characteristics of the people who drop out, but is that the best approach? I think it is important to think about these things as time, uh, especially as we get more um, data with path, Another thing that we don't talk about here, and this is a problem in my research, and it's becoming more of a problem like by magnitude as like more path data is collected. We also have a lot of people on path who like come and go, right? Like I'm looking at like the last observation period. So if you have somebody that's a wave one and wave two and they disappear wave three, four, and five, we have a bit of information for wave two. What do we do with the people who have wave one data, no wave two, no wave three, and they come back in wave four and disappear in wave five? Like how do you set up that person's risk period? And you're making big assumptions and you're like looking at their last risk period. Because if you model that, you're assuming that they didn't have the event in the preceding periods. For something like cardiovascular disease, where like 200 people over time experience the event, you're probably safe in assuming they didn't have it. But for things like smoking cessation, where 10% are uh, experience the event, that becomes a big problem. So I think we should think about the um, things like that. And I don't have a easy solution for that about how you restrict based on who comes and goes. But I know there's lots, lots of adults in the path data set. And if you look just at the basic data, there's lots of people who participate in wave one and then come back in wave five and there's nothing in the middle, right? So like that makes a longitudinal study problematic when you have like the start and the end and nothing in the middle. So yeah, something to think about as we go along, um, changing measurement inter intervals, something we've been talking about on our team you know, different ways that we can deal with the fact that there's two years between wave four and five. And as the path goes on, if it's not at the exact same time intervals, that's an assumption we're violating. I think the assumption is less problematic in the complementary log log models, but it's definitely not remedied. There's like other things we can do. We can do, um, um, yeah, we are doing other things to try to resolve that, but it's something to think about because, you know, longitudinal data does have assumptions. We should treat them carefully. Um, so I'm sure there's other things to consider, but these are like a short list of things that, you know, in our various studies we've been thinking about. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I'm happy to send more resources if people are interested. If you have specific things that, questions that you want to ask, feel free. If I have resources or code, I'm happy to send it to you. The caveat is that most of our code's in the enclave and it doesn't come out. So anything I send you, it has to be done in the public use files, but I'm happy to share what we do have. minutes left i feel like i've uh i failed you by not giving you two hours so the path data they have both the youth and the adults so this one you have to both together and they also have the one five for all of the data so that one you need uh so to, to get to see some of these youth are going to the adult one you can identify it from the given data yes 
Right. So like the way the past, and that your, your point, I think is an important one. Like I'm doing these studies. This is a very simple example. I'm taking people who are adults at wave one. I'm following them over time. And that's easy. It gets a little trickier when you have youth that age up to adults. Right. So you have, they start on wave one, they're in the youth data set. And then by wave three, these people are in the adult data set. And how do you account for that? And if you're interested in events that have like repeated outcomes or can have repeated outcomes, especially using like GE models, becomes a little bit easier. Um, I know Jean presented earlier and she's like a much better expert on like the combining of data sets. The issue becomes like a weighting thing about how you like get the weights right. But yeah, it's super important to think about like, yeah, we're following these people over time and a lot of the youth become adults and we have to think about how we're gonna like create our analytic samples. This is like, it's almost cheating to only look at adults at wave one because there are people who become adults later on. And for ENDS, for example, when it's predominantly used by young people, I think it's super important to have the young people who age up into adults because they're gonna have like different exposure times and stuff, which is important, yeah. I wanted to give you Right, so you can create multiple spell models where you can have the people have more than one event. And there's different ways you can do that. I think for smoking cessation, I think the relapse bit is important. Um, you can also set up an analysis where you look at people, you restrict the data set to people who quit and then you only model relapse. Try to see like how people relapse are different than people who don't. Um, but you can do the multiple spell thing as well. The problem that we've run into is trying to get the weights right with replica weights because you have to like have the repeated event of the individual and the weight, the replica weights are already like accounting for like a lot of stuff and I haven't got the weight set right. But I think, it, the, so the way I would do it in a simple way would be to restrict it to the people who quit and look at relapse because there's probably enough people to do that. And then look at the same analysis with relapse. And if you're finding that the predictors are substantively different, then right, these relapse becomes an important topic. And I think, I'd have to like look back at some of our other papers, like 30% plus of people who quit smoking are having a period of relapse at follow-up. There's a lot of relapse. And if you don't do the analysis, you're assuming that relapse isn't an important process. And if it's being driven by predictors that are in your model, right? I think it's important. So that's how I'd probably do the analysis in a simple way, but I'd try, try to probably think about the multiple spell model dealing with the weights. And um, yeah, which is a work in progress for a lot of us. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, thank you very much for your time.